it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here um, at this conference, which is, is something that uh, Long Island has needed for a long time. Uh, I just want to thank Brooke Haven National Lab and the, uh, the organizers for putting this together. I am I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be talking about lawns. Um, as a Mac person, I just lost all my notes, so this could be a little rough here. Because uh, in a Mac, you can see your notes, and you don't get to see them up there, but here. Like, oh, right. Last minute, please. Anybody know how to do it? You can't do it on Microsoft. You have to do it on Mac. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Reason number 472. <laughs> okay, so there's an ulterior motive for this talk today. I am hoping that by uh, the end of this talk that uh, several of you will have become enthusiastic about laws as I have and will wander around in the dark with a digital camera and perhaps a killing jar and just to help me document uh, Long Island's moth lawn, which has really not been looked at in about 50 years in any uh, serious way. And, 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 and yeah, so we'll talk about that. Um, so my, my, my hidden agenda is to make you into entomologists, moth people, and in specific, we call ourselves mothers. And as my friend Marie Wynn likes to say, mothers rhymes with authors. Um, I thought I'd start by talking about how I got into moths. And when I was in grad school in the mid-80s, I came home to visit my parents one summer, and I was on the phone with Guy Tudor for I don't know what reason, and he told me, you know, there's a bunch of us. Charlie Cobell's field guide just came out for the moths. The Peterson field guide for the moths just came out. And there's a bunch of us who are going um, out to Jamaica Bay at night to look at moths. We've been finding all these incredible things. The New York Butterfly Club you know, has a big membership now, and we're going out there. Would you like to come? That sounds sufficiently weird. Of course I want to come. So uh, I, I trundled. And, and even though uh, by my current standards, we saw a, a paltry number of species that night. I think I still have the notes. I think it was something like 14 species of moths. But I was amazed at the color and the form and the diversity of life that had been hidden by darkness and that was waiting to be discovered. And so um, all, all I, I, those of you who, are, who get persuaded by natural history to become fanatical, all those juices were flowing and, and all those emotions. And, um, I've spent about three years, every time I returned home to Long Island from Michigan, I would look at moths. But I was moving on, I was going on to postdocs and jobs, and I didn't want to collect moths. And uh, there was very little material. Charlie Cobble's book uh, had big gaps in it. So I put it away. Fast forward to 2002 and the birth of my son. And my wife and I entered the digital age, we bought a digital camera. And one night, two cosmic moths showed up on my screen on my deck in Sag Harbor. And I tried to figure out what they were. I couldn't figure it out. And friends, I said, you have a digital camera. Why didn't you photo them? Light bulb went on. And so in September of 2002, I started photographing moths. And by November, I had already cataloged them, like 200 species on my screen door. And, um, and at that point, it's interesting because there were only about six of us photographing uh, moths with digital cameras in the country. But now, there are literally thousands of people, and, and entomology as a whole has had a renaissance um, with, because of the digital camera. So that's how I got into moths. And uh, very soon thereafter, I started doing work uh, for Nature Conservancy, and uh, I, I, I had to collect, and now, now I do a lot of collection work as well. Um, so, how many moths do you think there are on Long Island? Some of you will know, but some of you might not. Well, why don't you try to put a number in your head? How many moth species on Long Island? Think of a number. Um, this is not known, so I can't answer it. <laughs> um, there is no comprehensive list. I am working on one, uh, and it's a really slow project. I've been working on it since 2009 or so, and I thought I was going to have it published by 2013, and it's still. Uh, looking slow. I'm, I'm going through the Smithsonian systematically. We go every Monday to the Smithsonian afternoon. For this, every Monday afternoon to the Smithsonian for four hours and look at from laws from Long Island, New York City. Um, Forbes in 28 documented about 900 species for Long Island, New York City. 
In a year on Easter Long Island, I'll see 850 species in a pretty good year. Maybe there's been a year where I've seen um, 1,000. My dad casino has recorded over 1,100 species wow. in Sag Harbor. And my guess is that the number is going to come in at 1,700 or above, maybe even 2,000. Uh, left out there when you include butterflies, about which I know nothing. I just want to get that out of here. <laughs> there are some really good butterfly people here, so any questions about them will be deflected. Um, the next thing, <laughs> moth watching is not bird watching. And I, I say this as, as important because there are a lot of bird watchers who have now seen 350, 380 species in New York State, and getting new species is kind of difficult, so they're starting to look at things like dragonflies and bees and moths. And I just want to get that out there. Why is it there are too many to remember? Okay. Um, I have heard that humans can, and I could quite find documentation of this, uh, 700 to 1,000 names simultaneously. Um, and moths challenge that limit. Um, the, the, there's another recent study that is a famous number of about 150 people you can really be Facebook friends with you know, at any one time. Um, second. Moths are really hard to ID. If you were bird people, imagine that, that you have many, many groups that are like pit next flycatchers. They, the pit next flycatchers, in fact, are somewhat easy compared to a lot of moths. And here's an example. Um, this was posted on Facebook the other day. The guy said, what are these? So I wrote back, here's the names for them. You might have thought they were all one, but I can see at least three species there. Uh, you can see I've color coded the names. Um, so that's one of the issues, that there is a lot of subtle species extinction. And then you have things like this, where you have things that basically are shaped alike, but they all are different colors. And how many species there? Well, the answer is one, right? This is a single thing. So it's chaos out there in the mall. <laughs> uh, this is Ali um, and, and the big issue is, and it's, it doesn't seem as it, it, those people who identify gull plumages and things like that and immature hawks have run into this regularly. But the thing is that maintaining a stable species concept in your mind to apply a name to turns out to be a difficult thing to do when you're dealing with, I don't know, a thousand species you know, that are in your memory bank. And so they change over time. I just I moderate a website where people send in photos and I assign them species names. And I very embarrassing that I always send my species kind of stuff prep, and I started identifying this thing as something else that, that it wasn't. I just realized that the other day in the Smithsonian. I was like, oh, oh that was a mistake. Better go change those. Um, so that's a problem. Next, superficial characters may not work. What you're looking at here is moth pornography. <laughs> <laughs> These are genitalia. I have books and books of this at home. <laughs> um, a lot of times, by looking at it, you can't tell. So what do we do? We dissect the genitalia. Um, and it's the standard Lepidoptera. DNA barcoding is also working, but right now it's 10 bucks a sample and you have a minimum of 1,000 sample minimum to send them off to wealth to get them barcoded. So if you want to spend 1,000 bucks, you can figure out 1,000 of your moths if they've already barcoded them. Uh, so that's the third thing that makes it not like bird, bird watching. Um, many years ago, uh, no, about three years ago, I was in Arizona. And um, I was glibly naming things that came into the sheet, because I'm pretty good at that. I can quickly pick up a bunch of names and start to remember them. And um, Jim Miller, who's pictured here, um, who is probably the preeminent uh, morphological taxonomist or systematist uh, for moths in North America, uh, said to me, how do you know that that's correct? And I said, well, there's a moth photographer's website under the books. And he says, hey. I said, how do you know they're correct? I said, what? He said, yeah, you have to look at the types if you want to know what the name really is. That was a mind-blowing concept, right? I said, um, you don't have to look at the types for birds. You're pretty sure that Peterson got it right. Now, there are a few mistakes, but they've been corrected over the years. But the moths are still kind of like the Wild West out there. What name actually applies to a thing you're seeing can be debatable. And because there are so many lookalikes, every lepidopterist makes mistakes. And unless you look at the types, you don't know when that mistake has been propagated down through, through the years. So uh, this is a big issue. And finally, 
there are undescribed species. If you see a bird on Long Island, you can be pretty sure that it has a validly published name. Um, not so with moths. I know of five to ten species on Long Island that are still not described. And here's pictures of some of them. Here we go. Uh, oh, and this is complicated by sibling species, which are, which are things that look alike, um, and, uh, but are actually reproductively isolated, right? They, they, so, and that seems to be a pretty common pattern in, uh, in, in Lepidopter because of host races, you know, uh, populations that uh, specialize on a particular host plant, and then the adults will still look alike, but they'll be slowly drifting apart, they'll be become reproductively isolated. But here are some undescribed species. Here's a Dolocomia species that's uh, common in the pine barrens here, and it, uh, it's found all the way to uh, North Carolina in the uh, Smokies. Uh, here is an idiom, which is um, very common in July around here. It looks like idia emula. That's what we would call it. Most people would call it that, but it's, it's actually its own species. Um, here is a Nepidia that people on Long Island call Canisaria, but it's actually not Canisaria. It's its own species that is waiting to be described. Here is a metaranthus, which everybody just always ignored. It's a pretty snappy little knot. The underside is even prettier. It occurs in wetlands from about the Delmarva Peninsula to Nova Scotia. Um, it's known, I think, as Metaranthus new species number three. Um, here's Carapetum pineata, which is what most people would call it, but it's actually a, it, it's associated with pitch pines uh, on the coast, and it seems to be different than the pineata that's inland and in a wavy description. At this point, I am making a plea for collections. Uh, collections have fallen out of favor uh, on a lot of people. Uh, they're seen to be antiquated. Um, and uh, there seem to be, some people think that we have collected enough already. Uh, personally, I think nothing could be further from the truth about that. Um, the difficulties associated with identification require that anybody who does follow work should at least for the difficult species deposit without your specimens. Um, there's all sorts of environmental work that can be done on specimens. DNA can be retrieved from specimens, so you can look at evolution over time. And we're getting better and better at taking older and older specimens and retrieving DNA from them. So um, there's all sorts of uh, specimens can be looked at for environmental pollutants. You can actually use specimens to trace when an environmental pollutant showed up in a place. Uh, so they provide all sorts of, uh, not just for faunal surface, but all sorts of other ecological information uh, to people. My personal goal would be to see that every state has a, has a lepidopter collection and a full-time curator. And I've just heard in the last year that both uh, the cur curatorships at uh, both the Carnegie and at uh, the Field Museum are under, are, are under consideration for being axed because of budgetary constraints, or at least being lumped, which is happening all over. The, um, and it's, it's making uh, scientific work in Lepidopter much more difficult. Uh, identification resources. There are tons of good books being published now, and we're li really living in a good time. Uh, in terms of field guides, Charlie Covell's Field Guide to the Moth still, to me, is the gold standard, even despite its mistakes, despite its gaps. Um, it did kind of the best job. If you live in the Northeast, especially New England, uh, Le Guide de Papillon du Quebec is very good. Uh, it's in French, which is fun because you get to learn French. Uh, so, and I now know what Sablon de means. Um, so, but the one thing I want to show you today is this really nice website called the Moth Photographers Group. And if you click on the Moth, if you type in Moth Photographers Group, um, you get this home page. And if you then, let's see, uh, let's see if this works. If you click on the plate series, you get a list of all the families here. And if you click on one of these, you get a nice field guide type of, of past moths. The problem is it's the entire United States that you see here. So you, you spend a lot of time. And then if you click on one of these numbers, you get a species page, which has the data map, living adults, and spread adult, and, and sometimes has larvae. This one didn't have larvae. And if you click on the large map, you get a phenology and a county by county account. Very nice. Um, does it have mistakes? Yes, a lot. Um, is it getting better? Probably. There, Bob Patterson, who's the, uh, the tireless worker behind this. Um, it's got genitalia library. It's expanding into Latin America. Uh, it's, it's really an impressive undertaking. And, uh, so, but it, my, my feeling is it's going to get better as time goes on. 
lot of people ask me, how do you attract moths? Okay, so what you do is you get a source of UV light, um, and you put up a sheet, and you have to have some sort of power source. I, I own a lot of um, uh, security batteries, because they, they're nice for recharging. And you sit out there and you bring your moth field guides if you want. I, and you photograph and collect and have a great time sitting there at night um, doing this thing. And if you're lucky, you get a sheet like this. <coughs> now, to be fair, this is southeastern Arizona in August, in the months soon. <laughs> but I've seen things somewhat close to that on Long Island. Um, and in the tropics, you wouldn't see the sheet. <laughs> um, there's also baiting. Now, baiting. Uh, as it's because I decided that I would finally reveal my top secret recipe for moth bait here to people who came from this conference. So here's what you do. One roughing banana, one bottle of beer, and one pound of brown sugar. You put the banana and the brown sugar together, and you pour the beer in until it makes a nice syrup. You're usually at that point left with half a beer, which is pretty nice to drink. <laughs> um, and if you, after you drink the beer, you are tempted to taste the bait. It's not so bad. <laughs> Next, what you can do is you can cover that bait up with an airtight cover and put it in the sun for two days. And at that point, you want to stand back when you take the cover off. But um, you then uh, throw in a shot of rum, maybe. Uh, that's only for people from the North Shore who are talking about it. I don't know if you run it. And you paint it on trees. Don't let it drip on the ground, lest ants find it and come up and eat it and scare away your moths. And here's a picture of uh, somebody painting a tree with a paintbrush. She's got a bait painter here. Um, it really smells. I remember when I was, uh, when I'd come back in the summers, I, I, in the 80s, from grad school, I would paint around my parents' house in Hampton Bay. So my mother would always say, they always know when you're home because of that smell. <laughs> and if you're lucky, you will get something that looks like this. And um, now, but that I'm setting you up for disappointment because baiting is the most highly variable thing you can do in terms of attracting moths. So you have to have a lot of patience. Different times of the year, different habitats on the same night will be one will be great, one will be terrible. Um, generally, places that are a little more xeric, a little more sandy, a little less water tend to be better. So pine barrens are great for baiting. And generally. Um, Mid-July and late and, and starting about mid-September are really good times on Long Island. Okay, it is some good day. Um, okay, my students always ask me, they say, Dr. McGinnis, aren't you afraid to be out photographing laws on Long Island at night? <laughs> and I say, okay, imagine you came upon me. I'm wearing light-colored clothing so I can see the ticks crawling on me. And I'm in a black light, so I'm glowing bright purple. And a flash is going off every 15 seconds. Would you approach me? <laughs> I have to admit, no one has ever approached me. I've never, I've spent a lot of time late at night in place a lot. I have never run into somebody. If they did, I'd probably have a heart attack. <laughs> but um, I, I try not to do great. Quick field guide to the moths for you, so you know some of the things to look for. Um, I'm only going to go through a few families of moths. The geometry, the earth measurers. Uh, it's so-called because there are your inchworms, those, those caterpillars that you see inching along are in fact mostly, for the most part, geometrics. Um, there are some stunning ones, I'm of course showing you some of the best. Um, but they sit with their wings open much like a butterfly. They're one of the few moths that sit with that open wing form. And uh, this is the variable at Tempioni. Is, is interesting because the summer form is yellow, but the spring form is brown. And you might think they're two separate species if you saw them, except that if you take winter pupae and you keep them at warm temperature, they all turn yellow, right? So it's a, it's a temperature effect. Um, that's one family, the geometrics. Then we have the giant noctuid, tuoid assemblage has been spent into four families now, uh, two of which are major, the arevids, which have a lot of old, there's been a major, because of molecules, because of DNA, there's been a lot of um, reworking of the taxonomy in recent years, as you all probably know. Um, so we have the Herminiae, which are the owlet moths. These are fantastic moths because they subsist on rotting plant material. And, and they're, on eastern Long Island, at least, they're really abundant. And they can be the most abundant in your study. And they, they're really cool looking in profile. I mean, 
It's those pallets. Nice. But <coughs> how can you survive on, on dead plant material and, and be good? Well, and, and, and have big populations. The answer is they're probably getting their nutrition from the fungus that is growing on the dead plant material. And so they're really, uh, they're really fungivores. Um, we have the Archaeidae, which used to be its own family, the tiger moths. Uh, they're all brightly colored like this. It's a uh, virgin tiger moth. Whoa. Um, and they, this is a warning coloration idea. If you touch them, they, they start oozing out of their thorax as this acrid brown li liquid, which does taste really bad. Um, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't eat one of these. Um, and so they, they're also this cool family. They have bat jammers in their family, and they, they're a very, very neat family. Um, then we have the Lymantriani, and this is a famous moth. Does anybody know it? Yes. Yeah. Gypsy moth. This is the famous gypsy moth. This is a male. You can tell by its uh, feathery antenna. Um, and this is an exotic species, right? It's introduced. And the females are flightless, and they have wings, and they're bright white. And you don't tend to see them as much unless you actually go out and look for them. But the males will see fluttering. My uh, professor, an undergraduate professor, once um, drop a single drop of gypsy moth pheromone inside this car. And he said the day we sold it, there would be male gypsy moths battering themselves <laughs> against this car all of July, trying to find that female. Uh, and then the final family, uh, the Arivani, which includes the underwings, which is uh, a group that people love, because they sit with the wings closed, and they camouflage, they're camouflaged like in this park. And they uh, have these beautiful startle, supposedly for startle uh, against predators, especially birds. They open their wings, and that gives them that one half second, one tenth of a second advantage to fly before the bird nails it. Judging by the number of uh, damaged ones I find, birds are missing them a lot, but getting part of the wings. The weird thing about them is they have strange names, like Paleo Gamma, which means the old wife. And they're, these are largely. Um, named by two lonely men in the 1800s <laughs> sexually hung up. They, named, they have names like the consort, the girlfriend, the new bride, <laughs> the new wife, the bride, the concubine. I mean, they're just like uh, the consort. That's it, the consort. Um, which, uh, which queen do you think is more accurate? Um, I would say these two are better than this slightly. It's good. Yeah, this is slightly better. Um, here's a rare moth. It's in the other part of the Noctuoidea, the Noctuidae. They're called cutworms and darts. If you've ever um, grown a garden and had your little row of beans all there nice and you go to bed in the morning, they're all lying over. It's because of these kinds of moths, and this is one of the reasons why uh, gardeners hate them. Um, so, uh, they tend to be the little brown job. My wife likes to say, but you, that's a very fascinating shade of brown you have there. You know, this new moth. He said, look at this thing I found. It's brand new. Very nice gray. <laughs> um, and, oh, what's that? Oh, OK. <laughs> that was new. Um, here's, here's a very spiffy and rare moth uh, in the Noctuids, the uh, pink streak, uh, which is found in grasslands. And here's a really rare thing that I've only ever seen one summer at Teddy Roosevelt Park in Montauk. Doesn't have a common name. Now we get to the charismatic megafauna. <laughs> OK. The sphinx moths, kind of uh, like the F-wing fighters. They're highly mobile. They, they feed on the wing. They have these long tongues that uh, stick into tubular flowers gathering, uh, gathering nectar. And they inadvertently pick up pollen. This is the Akamon Sphinx, and here is the Huckleberry Sphinx, and uh, in Northwest Harbor. Here's the Small Light Sphinx, which is actually still pretty common in many parts of the island. And the, the, the previous one, the Huckleberry, is still pretty common in places like uh, Conequat River, and any place where there's in the uh, uh, Edgewood Preserve. Um, then we have the the, the ones that everybody first wants to see when they first start mothing, the, the, the giant silk moths. Saturnity, Isle Moth, my favorite lemon and raspberry sherbet moth, <laughs> the rosy maple moth, polyphemus, which is still regular on Long Island. How can you argue with that? <laughs> still fairly common on Shelter Island in Montauk and, and, and uncommon but regular throughout the whole island. 
And finally, it was Wild Walnut Moth, which was thought to be gone from Long Island until, until uh, I found it in uh, 2004 out in Montauk. And it's also at, uh, on Shelter Island still. And it seems to be expanding back onto the mainland. So, and that thing is about this big across. So, and it's larva is called the Hickory Horned Devil. It's really formidable. You saw one once? The larvae. Yeah, where'd you see it? Uh, Pittsburgh by a funeral. Oh, God. How long ago? Years ago. Oh. Did you take a picture? Did you ever find it? I want. I would love the information. I can. I can. I would. Cool. It's on West Block Road. It's on That's great. That's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Are they associated with walnuts? Well, we don't know what they're associated with out of the East End. There's, they have, over their entire range, they have huge hosts from that range. But what they eat, what they don't really know. Sweets. There's one suggestion that they're eating uh, some sumacs in some places. There's also some really great small moths. Moths are historically divided into the macro, the large ones I've just shown you, and the small ones, the micro moths. This is the tartrucid or the leaf roller family of the portrait moths. Uh, there's some really beautiful ones that you can find. And then the other big group of small moths is the pyroloids, uh, which are two families of stout moths. And um, you might want a fantastic genus called Kramis. They sit on grass and they just blend in. It, it, it looks like it wouldn't be camouflaged. You cannot see them when they're sitting on, on a stalk of grass. And this is fantastic moth. It's found on Long Island wherever prickly pear still grows. It's an obligate prickly pear. It's very common in that peak, for example, which is where this is from. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you a second. Here's a phylogeny, an evolutionary tree of uh, moths. The, the width of the black band shows you the approximate number of species in the family. Uh, the red shows you the macro moths here. And as you can see from this, the red is a nice monophyletic group. It's, it is a real, macromoths are, are a valid taxonomic category. But the micromoths are everything in green. And there's such an amazing diversity of form, of size. Several of the micromoths are really big. Here is a, is a moth which is about two inches long, the cosset. Uh, this thing makes it a living by eating dead wood. It takes two years to develop. Um, and it's, it's, Adults fly around. They're still fairly common on Long Island. Uh, this one is uh, on Pseudocasia rubinia. What's that? What's that? Black uh, locust. Black locust. Thanks. I'm a terrible botanist. Only know things whether birds nest in them or insects eat them. Um, so micro moths have this incredible diversity of uh, of feeding strategies. It's clearly a poly, a paraphyletic group. It is. Um, it's not really a, a very good category. Um, people always ask me, where do butterflies fit in? They're up here in yellow here. That's butterflies. And you can see that they are a, um, a monophyletic group, but they're wholly contained within the uh, macro lepidoptera. And it, it, it sort of tells us that the order shouldn't be called butterflies and moths. It should be called moths. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're a highly derived day flying moth, if you want to ask anybody else. You know. um, ecology of moths. Okay. Let's, ecology of moths. Moths, the primary, okay, we're going to do this. Um, the, the primary thing that moths do is uh, herbivory. They, they, they mainly feed by herbivory, although there's a whole family that specializes on keratin and eating things that have keratin in them. Clothes moths, for example, which we'll come back to. Um, and so you can thank moths for the fact that vegetation isn't as abundant as it could be. <laughs> and, and I say this, you know, somewhat in jest, but they are a very important, you know, second link in the food chain. They are the primary consumers. And one of the pri primary effects of that is, is this. Why do birds migrate, right? And, um, well, Every spring after the flush of leaves, there is this incredible flush of protein-rich, calorie-laden, vitamin-succulent larvae. And these neotropical birds, why in evolutionary time do they leave the nice neotropics and decide to come north? Well, 
Caterpillars had a lot to do with it. Um, and so, so there, as my friend Dave Wagner says, moths are the hamburger of terrestrial ecosystems. <laughs> and if you, by the way, I'm not going to talk much about larvae today, but if you ever get a chance to see Dave speak on larvae, don't miss it. It's just fantastic. He's done amazing work, um, and he's put out these amazing field guides on caterpillars, which you should just have because they're fun to look at. Um, moths are also pollinated. Here's a pretty rare moth, unless you know, but go and look at uh, goldenrod in, in sand dunes in September, and then you'll find it on Long Island. Uh, fairly uncommon collections. Um, moths are also for us good indicator species. If you find uh, Burgess's apania uh, in a place you can, in numbers, you can be pretty sure you have a pretty healthy grassland on your hand. If you find the innocent angle sporanza exonerata, which was not described until 2008, by the way, um, if you find that, you can be pretty sure you have a good patch of Quercus folia scrub oak, my favorite tree, um, which most people find horrifying. <laughs> it's a great lepidopter tree. There's about 25 species of rare lepidopter that use that as a host plant, including buck moth. <laughs> <laughs> he said, are you going to talk about buck moth? I said, no, I don't buck moth. So, the buck moth, which I love, and if you've never gone out to see the flight, of the, the nuptial flight of the buck moth, if you've never gone out to see the flight of the buck moth, it, it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor in, in the second weekend in October going to look for them. And they are beautiful um, moths, and I don't have a picture. But they are a Saturn need, small one, day flying, so that's nice. You, can do it. you don't have to go look at night. And uh, they, they <laughs> nest in pine barrens. And unlike their larvae, they're not poisonous as adults. Some of the work I've done, um, Back in 2004, uh, Bruce Lauer took a chance on me and, and said, oh, let's have him do this study in, at, at uh, Eddie Roosevelt County Park here in Montauk. Montauk used to have 10,000 acres of grassland about the 1870s, 1880s. It now has about two to 500. And Bruce was really keen on bringing some of that back. And so uh, he, he burned it. He personally burned it. Um, and I'll show you how he did it. Here's, here's what it looks like now. And here's the scrub forest right here. And here is restored grasslands from here. And that's just fantastic. When I go there, I, I, every time, ah, Long Island's great. Um, so he, he got a crew, he assembled a crew, and they chopped down a bunch of vegetation, and then they lit it on fire in, in April, I believe this is, and it burned. And it looked like that because the East End is frigid until June 15th. Um, and then it slowly came back, right? And by the end of the summer, we had a beautiful eastern grassland. And so, very, very quickly. I did 11 samples from October to May, twice a month, at the new, within four days of the new moon. One sample was done with a bucket trap to kill the moths. The second sample was done by counting moths on a sheet. I would set up four sheets and run between them. I spent 15 minutes at a sheet and do three or two or three things at night, two in the morning, it collapse. Um, and here's what we found. We had a burn treatment and an unburn treatment, and we had two sites. And if you look at the number of species, there were many more species in the unburn, right? And, but if you look, and if you look at the number of individuals, come on, there we go. If you look at the number of individuals, same pattern. So that was like, oh, the burning reduces moths. That's interesting. So let's look at this a little more carefully. So I decided, OK, I'm going to look at the moths that we caught and look at their host plant category here. And I'm not going to give you enough time to see that. Um, so I was really interested in what the things that ate grass and what the forb feeders, what the things that ate herbaceous plants were doing. And I didn't really care so much about what the tree feeders were doing and what the shrub feeders were doing, because those weren't rare habitats. And you can see, when I looked at it this way, I had 56 grass eaters and 108 species that were herb eaters, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of trees. And so then I started to look at what happened there. And if you look now, you see there's no depression of species between the burn and the unburn. Um, and there's a big improvement in numbers for the things that eat grass. In the burn plots, there were many more individuals. So fire was working. We were pretty happy about that. So then I said, better look at herbaceous feeders, right, forb feeders. And here, there was a slight improvement in the number of species in the unburn, and a same sort of slight improvement in the number of individuals. So then we looked at rarities. No difference in the number of rarities between burned and unburned. 
but in terms of the number of individuals, there was a slight improvement. So burning seemed to improve the rare species. In Nature Conservancy a little bit happy because they, they like to be preserving rare species. Um, and so our conclusions from, the, from this were really that, OK, burning is probably a, a good thing to restore grassland. It brings the, the animals that are associated with grasslands come back. The rare species come back, but we have to do it carefully. We have to maintain refugia. Right? We have to have places for, for we, if we burned everything at once, we, we would risk losing some species perhaps. There's a similar study in the Pine Barrens. I just showed you this because I had to show you Gerhard's underwing. It's really rare moth like this from New Jersey to Cape Cod, and then again in Oklahoma and Nebraska. It's the only two places it ranges. Abundant on Long Island if there's Quercus elicifolia around. Scrub. My favorite tree. Did I mention that? <laughs> um, and similar study, uh, we we're trying to look and see if we could bring back species associated with scrub oak if we burned the, the, the pine barrens. Uh, two and four, we did the study two and four years after the, uh, the burning. And we found that no difference in species, but that the unburned plots had about 30% more individuals. So we held on to the species, but, but the burning had an effect. However, there were 47% more individuals of scrub oak feeders in the burn plots. So that attempt to bring those scrub oak feeders back um, really worked. And, and since a large number of the rare moths listed in New York State feed on scrub oak, uh, this was, to me, an important insight. We feel pretty certain that some fire resuscitates scrub oak and the biodiversity. Mishomak, um, Mike Laspia invited me out there, and I uh, jumped at that opportunity. I have seen all of Mishomak, but only in the dark. Um, and what a place. Um, a lot of deer. Um, and ticks. I, in 2008, yeah, a lot of ticks. In uh, 2008, uh, I said four traps a night, two, two nights a month. Um, I caught more than 20,000 individuals of 727 species. I discovered a previously unknown species of portricid, which is only known from eastern Long Island. Its current range is Shomac to the Sofo field at Bridgehampton to the Walking Dunes. That's just an old range in the world. I found 26 rare species of shelter as well as seven additional listed species. And we showed that Shelter Island was a refuge for both the Imperial Moth and the Royal Walnut. This is the Imperial Moth, also about that big. Fantastic moth. And here's the new species, really, you know, that big. Um, fine. Oh, we're at the end. OK. This really ticks me off. <laughs> that didn't happen. I'm sorry. That just did not happen, OK? You do, trust me, people. If you go in your house and a moth flies in with you, do not panic. It will not eat your clothing. <laughs> How do I know this? How can I promise this? Because moths that eat clothing are in the family Tenaeidae, and they're teeny. This thing is that thing. I have never, in 10 years of looking and spending more hours than you want to know, I have never seen a clothing moth at a black light or a incandescent light outside. In fact, I don't have a photograph of one yet. A friend of mine had them in her, in her sweaters, and I meant to go over and photo. I never got there. I still haven't seen the darn thing. Um, so this, which was in a British paper and was, you know, I hate moths, was the title of the article. And this is why those moths did not make that hole. Something that looked like this, that this is a tropical moth that gets transferred from house to house by people. Um, it doesn't fly in. So take that yellow bulb out of your, of your light socket. Put in an incandescent, and maybe hang a black light there and enjoy the moths that you see at your front door. And let me know about it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
In general, the males have the antennae because they are cherchéing la femme, right? They are looking for females. And the females are putting out the pheromone, and the males are following. And it's really, um, it's an amazing thing, because, I, I mean, just the human term, but think about it as humans. These female moths will come out, and their wings will just be blowing up, and there'll be a male maybe with them, right? So, <laughs> couldn't you wait? You know, no, she's putting out, you know, like, Frankly, for adult moths, like especially those big ones, they don't have any mouth parts. It's all about sex and dispersal and laying eggs, right? That's their life as an adult. And you know, eating was the caterpillar phase. And so they just, you know, and, and if you anthropomorphize evolution, they just want to get mated and then get their eggs out as soon as possible, right? And and that's the strategy. So, um, yeah, it's if you see big feathery antenna, that's probably a male. We have to cut it in a little bit. Perhaps after we leave the chair. Oh, I just wanted to say that it's funny, but you should name this. Bringing Nature Home, and yeah, Doug Talley wrote about Bringing Nature Home. He, he encourages you for all sorts of reasons, particularly for birds and, and, and insects, to plant, to plant, and particularly certain native plants in your gardens.